Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. And I just want to uh, say thank you to everybody who has been waiting for me to return, who's stayed with the channel. It was a little bit of a, I think it was the longest gap I've had to date. Uh, and part of that was just really trying to work on getting the work board project done. And there was a lot more work to do. And uh, that meant I just sort of focused in on it. And the spring, summer draws me outside to do yard work. But I've set that all aside. Long story short, I had a gap. I'm back. I super appreciate you guys and gals who have stayed with me. And if you are new to the channel and this is your first video, then you don't know that I have been away. So welcome. I'm starting with a fresh, uh, fresh slate with you. And I welcome you wholeheartedly and I'm glad you've joined me. The uh, cocktail for this evening is an unusual one. Uh, this is Mama Wana. Mama Wana is rum that has been steeped in uh, wood chips that have already been sort of pre-soaked in wine with fruit and uh, and some other kinds of sweet raisins, I think, and something like that. Uh, my wife takes trips to uh, overseas each year. She takes students um, as part of like an EF Tours trip. Uh, this uh, year she's actually, right now, she's in England doing the um, AP Literature Tour. She's an English teacher. And um, last year I went with her on the trip to the Dominican Republic. And when we got there, there were all sorts of places where you could buy these bottles that are labeled Mama Juana. And I was like, I, I don't, what is that? I gotta know. And so we had, and so we had a, uh, a great tour guide and he was explaining to me that um, this is, he kind of likened it to making bad rum good. Um, but it's, it's something where you use it um, and over time it continues to improve. Uh, I did a little research online and it's, uh, you know, like they'll say like the bottle's good for 10 years. And he was giving me the impression that if the longer you leave the rum in it, the longer, the better the rum gets. And that's not entirely true because the wood chips leach a lot of tannins into the rum. So the first round was pretty astringent. Uh, and I was like, let me try it over ice better. <laughs> so, um... So this is the second round of rum that has gone through it, and um, I'm almost, I'm almost out here. Um, but you could also buy these wood chips like uncured, so you could just get the chips, and then you could season it with wine with your own fruits. Um, you don't have to just put uh, uh, straight rum in it. You could put wine in it. You could put a wine rum mix. You could add your own flavors. You add honey to it, and all sorts of things. Right? It's very, it's a very um, interesting drink and uh i you know, it says on the back here i don't know if you'll be able to read that uh add rum or wine bee honey raisins let it rest for a week then drink in a short cup so um i have been uh leaving it um you know steep for i don't know like a month or two and then i'll get around to remembering oh because i got it in the back of the cabinet and i'm like oh my gosh i forgot about my mama wanna. And um, so this was um, mostly white rum with some dark rum in it. And you can see how it, it changes the uh, color. Um, and it was actually, I think, a little more red on the first round. So I'm curious to see how that bottle continues to change as I um, continue to drink from it. And uh, I'm very glad I got it. It's a little bit unusual. Maybe you could order one online. I don't know. Uh, but in any case, um, mama wanna is the drink of this video. Okay, so <laughs> um, if you are new to the channel, I'm just going to say um, I'm not going to explain anything in the background about this project. So if you're interested in getting a little more information on how this project got here, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah! These are the series of videos where this is finished. This is finished. And the board is so big and there are so many things with so much detail on it. Um, I'm going to be breaking up this wrap up into um, sections for each of the kinds of elements that are on the board. All right. So we're going to be looking at the plants today. Um, but again, if you're new, um, there are 17 videos currently in the playlist for this project. 
and I have, um, if you're a patron or you become a patron, I have over 50 posts that are documenting some of the steps I took along the way and some of the experiments that I did and, and thoughts. So um, that's available as background reference materials uh, for anybody who might be interested. Um, at the end, I'm going to have some notable mentions and um, a little something extra. And because these, uh, this video in particular, because it, it's kind of new, I'm back. I already shot this video once and I'm shooting it again. And I'm glad I did. Um, anyway, because this is going to be a little bit longer, um, I put st time temps, time stamps in the description down below. So uh, if you want to skip ahead to a certain section, you'd be able to do that. And because um, it has been a little while since I've been away, I'm trying to put a little, a little extra effort into this video um, to try to say, you know, thank you for waiting for it. So uh, got lots of editing to do after I get done shooting. So we better get over to the bench and see what it is that I actually did. So these are the plant clumps that I created for the board. And uh, I was going for a subtropical look. The client's models have a jungle theme to them. And I just didn't think I could go with a jungle since I had put the a large tree on the board, which we will see in, in a future video. Uh, and that tree is, you know, deciduous and uh, it's just is not tropical. So I decided to go for a subtropical feel so I could mix in some, uh, you know, sort of deciduous plants, use um, uh, some of those types of flowers that are, you know, typically found uh, on some of my other work. And then also go in and use some uh, plastic plants to give it a tropical feel. And I felt like it created a pretty nice balance. And in making these uh, clumps, I decided to go with something different. I wanted them to be uh, without a base. And that way that when they're placed on the board, it doesn't, you know, you don't have the, the edge of the base sort of uh, conflicting with the eye. So I tried something new and I used hot glue as the substrate for the clumps. Uh, so what I did is I uh, made a, a little, um, in this case, I made a little plastic wall and I put uh, parchment paper over it. And then I could press uh, plant after I added some hot glue right up against it and then um, build out from there. And I think that worked out really quite well for creating sort of baseless clumps. That's what I'm calling them at the moment. It was not uh, particularly difficult. Of course, you know, it's just a little extra time to do that. And then at the end, I could um, flip them over. Let's see if I can do this from here. And then I backfilled in some areas that were gaps using more hot glue. And the base is pretty sturdy. It's uh, a little flexible. Uh, and I think it's great. Just uh, don't store it in the attic where it's going to get really hot or it's all going to melt and things are going to fall over. Uh, for the components that I used in creating the base, um, much of it is uh, some things you've probably seen before. So there's um, some uh, uh, clump foliage from uh, Woodland Scenics, Super Turf from um, Scenic Express, tufts that have flowers. These are ones I actually made, a little grass tuff, and then I use some, uh, oh gosh, what is it called? It's like floor foam. Hold on, let me look. So this is kind of an aside, uh, but um, I p purchased this flower soft a uh, long time ago now, a couple of years, I think. And it's sort of a ground foam, not that dissimilar from what um, we would typically use, sort of the consistency of Super Turf from Woodland, uh, from Seeing Express. And then I used um, plastic plants, and these are um, a variety of plastic plants that I have collected over the years. Uh, some of them are aquarium plants. I picked up a whole bunch of uh, palm trees, a couple different uh, styles, I think off of eBay, I think from somebody in China. You know, I've had these for probably five years. I can't quite remember. Um, and then I picked up um, a variety of plants online over the years. So um, what I've done, and if you are familiar with my jungle uh, plant stands that I made mm, hmm, a while ago, so 
Um, you're gonna need the, wait a minute, there we go. You're gonna need the back finger for that. Uh, those are probably uh, maybe two years ago, somewhere in the back catalog of videos. Um, what I do is I take um, pretty much every plant and I tear them apart and then I put them back together in ways that look better than the uh, arrangement you would get if you just grabbed them right off the vine and stuck them down. So, you know, I put in lots of little pieces like this to make smaller plants. Um, these were uh, like tendrils off of a longer vine. I cut those off and then used them individually to make a sort of grass-like clump. And I did something new um, for these uh, plants that I haven't done before, which is to paint them. I don't know why that never occurred to me before. Um, and I think I saw a video where somebody was painting plants and I was like, I just slapped my forehead and said, uh. so I decided to do it for this uh, project. And I used uh, my airbrush and I painted all up um, the different pieces and different shades of green, mixed some um, to make some slightly different greens. There's only so many colors I have. And you know, there's a lot of shades of green. There's an almost infinite number. Um, some of them, like um, this little plant down here, I gave a wash. And for these, I uh, used a little uh, brush dipped in some uh, paint and I did a little splatter effect. It was a short bristled brush and I could just flick it, you know, a little bit um, and get that spattered effect. And the reason I chose to do that was that Monstera, which is um, the type of plant that that is, uh, or at least is modeled as, um, often has variegation in the leaves, which means um, there are, are spots in it. Now these don't represent how the variegation actually appears. You know, it's the first time I ever tried that, and I think, wow, it just really added a lot to that plant. Uh, and it, it, these are sort of like my favorite leaves in all of the clumps. And here is an example of a freestanding one. So the one before had that flat back, and it's meant to go up against the frame and the top of the board. Uh, but this one I made as a, you know, a complete 360, uh, so they can be placed um, anywhere on the lower section of the display board. And it highlights the uh, different types of tree work that I did and shows, um, I think, some of the, the jungle-esque foliage a little bit better. So like, for instance, this uh, little palm, um, you know, I uh, didn't like the way the top of the spike that holds the leaves shows. So I took a little flower tuft uh, from goldenrod from Woodlands, from Scenic Express, from their plant line. And I just cut those tufts off and just glued them in there. And it makes like a nice little flowering part coming out of the palm and hides that post. So there's a, a little bit of a tip. And, uh, you know, another example, right? So, so I guess what I'm saying is don't look at something and think, how does this work on its own? Think about what parts of it you can take apart and use to make it better, right? So this was um, part of a larger strand. Take that piece off. These were um, actually palm fronds from the tree you just saw. And I decided that if I don't put them close to the palm trees, I could just use them in a sort of like a fern-like clump. And in here, I have um, put in a couple uh, berries on top of, there you go, you can see it in the second camera, to um, hide again the union of all of these leaves. So, um, you know, a little mix and match, a little piece, piecing here, piecing there to make sure that they all kind of work a little bit better. Some of them got a wash, some of them didn't, uh, just to try to add a little variety. So the trees that you see are, um, first I'll talk about this one. Um, this is a piece of an armature that is no longer available. These were um, bare trees produced by scenescapes, and they're quite large. Um, there, was a, there were big trees with all these sort of wiry branches, and um, what I did is I cut off some of those branches and made them into a sort of, you know, thin kind of, I think a little more dynamic looking tree. So there's a little bend in the, uh, in the uh, stem, the trunk, if you will, and I could shape them a little bit. And then those just got clump foliage. So a little clump foliage, and then I sprinkle on a little bit of the knock leaves. I, I spray it with a little hairspray, sprinkle on some of the leaves, and you're gonna invariably, at least I do, um, get leaves along the stem. And I found that because hairspray is very easy to wash off with water, I could just get a little brush in there and I could just dab off 
the areas where the leaves weren't supposed to be and that cleaned up pretty easily. I really uh, like um, how that came out. Now the bigger tree is um, a little more complicated. So I've put on some Spanish moss and I um, had a Patreon post where uh, and a mini vid where I show a little bit about how I did that but I used the fibers polyfiber from Woodland Scenics and I teased those out into thin bits um, and then I um, airbrushed them with white paint and what's nice is the fibers are a little green so they actually show a little green kind of translucency coming through because not all the fibers were covered equally and that's pretty close to the color of Spanish moss I think I could have gone with a little bit more gray in the uh, color but um, that was how I uh, ended up and I'm, I'm pretty okay with it it's a right bitch <laughs> to get these to hang straight down. Um, some areas I got it a little bit better than others. A little tricky to glue on, a little tricky to make the tops look natural. It's, uh, hmm, it's a bit of a trick. I think um, the effect is okay, but I wish I had a little bit more variation in the thickness and the lengths of the clumps. Um, going much thinner, it actually makes it a little more challenging to work with, so I decided to forego that for this project and just run with it as it is. Um, and it ties in pretty well with the big tree, and a few of the other trees have it as well. To do the canopy, I used uh, Mr. Gravit's method, uh, Gordon Gravit. He has books on making trees, and that is to use the, again, the polyfiber uh, pulled very, very, very thin, spray it with hairspray, sprinkle on some uh, fine turf from Woodland Scenics, spray it again with some hairspray, sprinkle on a little more. Um, I also mixed in some super turf uh, from Scenic Express and I built those layers up to a level that I liked and then I could cut it into pieces and place it where I wanted on the tree uh, and I think that worked pretty well. I like it a lot and um, I'll be exploring that technique more as uh, my tree work continues. One trick uh, tip I should say with this is to then spray it with a matte clear coat, a kind of a heavy varnish. So this is actually more durable than it looks. I was pretty pleased with how the final foliage came out and I even accidentally once tried to pick up the tree from the foliage. Don't do that. Uh, but I did and it really actually kind of held together. I was like, oh, ooh, not bad. So um, I was pretty happy with that. And then um, I also created uh, some very small clumps that could be scattered amongst the units and in the foreground so that I have a variation of height with the tallest ones in the back to kind of bring the eye up towards the back. Um, these are, again, these are uh, hot glue foundations and more of those plants that I modified than um, painted and uh, gives you a little bit of a sense of the variety uh, these are pretty quick to put together. I think they look really nice. Took a little while to paint them. So, you know, if you want to emulate that uh, effect, yeah, it's something to consider. Uh, but um, kind of fun little clumps. I, I like them. I think it was um, a worthy adventure into learning um, how to paint them and the improvement that it creates. It's a vast improvement. And actually on my Patreon page, I have a post that shows the before and after of the painting and I've made that a public post. Uh, so if you go to my Patreon page, um, you will see there's a, a, a list of uh, tags in the side that show like, uh, you know, different categories. And one of them is patron only posts examples. <laughs> so it's like, what do I normally post for my patrons? So you can go and check that out. And this um, is one of the most recent posts where I show uh, what some of these plants look like uh, before and after. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, taking a look at the uh, plants and hopefully some of the things I mentioned um, could provide you with some ideas or um, areas to explore for yourself um, in your own uh, terrain work with plants, particularly plastic plants. A lot of potential there that's frequently, um, I think, under uh, underexplored. How's that? So um, notable mentions. First, I want to mention Tabletop Spot. Uh, Tabletop Spot is a channel that sort of um, popped up not that long ago. Um, put up a couple great vids. One um, video was on um, how he pours plaster into Herstart's molds. 
very, I was like, that's smart. So that's worth checking out as well as a video he put up on making uh, your own grass tufts and making them a little nicer than some of the store-bought tufts that you can get a little more interesting. And I thought that was definitely worth a watch. He hasn't put up any videos since then. So I'm hoping he will continue to post um, at least sporadically So because uh, he has great ideas and I think um, a nice delivery. Uh, so tabletop spot. Um, the second one is Life After Work. This is a uh, video channel by a gentleman who has retired, Life After Work. Um, he's in his 70s, I think, and he is a uh, miniature military modeler. And his current project that I was checking out was um, the USS New Jersey. And he is really interesting. I was immediately taken with it uh, because he has an incredibly uh, keen eye for details. So he wants his models to match the actual ship. So of course, when you buy a kit, you know, there's different things that are wrong with it, you know? And so he's like, okay, well, here's where I have to take this off and here's how I have to shave this down and these aren't right. So I had to drill this hole out and everything. So um, that kind of attention to detail, of course, is uh, close to my heart. And he also um, has this really nice, very slow pace about it uh, and explains the things he's doing. Uh, and his video quality is, is constantly improving as well. Uh, and I don't know if I can endorse it more. I felt like the kind of thing you definitely want on the back, you know, in the background next to you in the computer so you can glance up at it while you're painting your miniatures or working on your own. Because the things he's doing with the military models are things that apply to any of us when we're working with plastic kits. Uh, so I think there's something there that everybody can appreciate. And uh, I think his channel is vastly underviewed, vastly underviewed. So um, that is Life After Work. Uh, you could jump over there and check that out. And um, before I go into some viewer comments, new section, I just want to um, put out there a, uh, a reminder that if you are interested in supporting me, um, you can support me through Patreon. Uh, there's a lot of content that I put up there for you. And uh, recently I um, added some RAM to my computer to make video editing easier. <laughs> There's quite a bit. Um, so, viewer, whoa, did you see that? Did you see that catch? So, um, quick um, viewer comments. I've seen some other videos doing this where they like do like a rapid fire at the end. Viewer comments, I thought I would try that. It might help me keep up with comments. Um, so, uh, first one was from Richter Scale Studios. Um, he was commenting on the Hobbit diorama that I did. And he was saying how moving the flowers from in front of Bilbo's house, so you have to go back, if you're not familiar with the project, you can go back and look at, um, moving the flowers from the front of the house out to the path leading down to Gandalf and Frodo would help bring the eye that, I'm sorry, I'm looking because the battery is getting low, would help bring the eye down to them and help transition to what, what I had aimed for was being the focal point, which I thought was really interesting, very effective and something small. Uh, so you can go back and take a look at that video and see if those uh, arrangements might make sense in your mind. Um, then Brandon Bacher made a comment, and I'm paraphrasing it very roughly here, but uh, that Gandalf and Frodo um, are sort of the you know, they're not a big player at the point of their meeting, right? They're just part of the world of Middle Earth. And so having them be, you know, off to the side is kind of reflective of their role that they have at that point in the story. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, I didn't justify the arrangement that well. It made me feel better about it. Uh, his comment is over on there, so you could get the details of it um, if you go back and look at those comments. But I just wanted to thank Brandon for giving me a very different way of looking at the diorama in terms of, um, you know, uh, how it was arranged for impact. Um, 
I had another comment from Joseph D. Pasquale, hope I pronounced you right, about hydrocal rocks with sculpt mold filler. So he's doing um, hydrocal molded rocks from Woodland Scenics molds. And then um, he has spackled in between the cracks with sculpt mold and then when he, to fill them, the gaps, and then when he um, is using tint washes to uh, to tint the stone, uh, Woodland Scenics uh, produces these tints, the sculpt mold is taking up the tint in a different way than the hydrocal is, so all those little fixes are all of a sudden standing out really brightly, so to speak. Yeah, that's gonna happen. Um, none of these different plaster um, uh, compounds accept things the same way. Uh, and I thought a fix for that might be to um, take some hydrocal and get a brush and paint it into over the sculpt mold. And the blending of that between the real rocks is maybe going to depend on the texture of the rocks you're working with. But by um, stippling it in, you can put a little a thin coat of hydrocal over the sculpt mold. And I think that will help. Um, it might not be perfect because the layer won't be as thick as the rocks because plasters are porous, so it's drawing in that uh, tinting liquid, but um, having a face of hydrocal on it should help make it blend a little bit better. So uh, try a spot, see if it works. Um, but um, yeah, anytime you mix um, uh, different kinds of materials like that with tinting, uh, that will definitely be um, an obstacle. So. consider giving a final coat of areas with whatever the dominant medium is would be my recommendation and uh, Kinnaman 100 thinks and this is this is really paraphrased um, but that I'm uh, too critical of my work let's just put it that way he framed it a little differently for the Hobbit diorama um, and um, I just want to say that yeah moving on so, no, <laughs> um, I am critical, and I also like sharing some of that critical perspective with you so that you know when you do your own projects that when it has a problem, you don't think it came out as well as you wanted it to. That happens to me too. And to see where I think I could have made it better so that you can get ideas on how why I think it would make it better, right? Why do I think where it's good here, but it could be better? And then you can have that kind of perspective when you're working on your own terrain. I mean, at the end of, of a project, if I ever say, that's it, I nailed that, that is perfect, I, that would be the last project I probably ever do because how could I do better then? I don't know. So uh, when, I, when I'm when i critical about how I could change things, it's just being reflective and I'm trying to model that for other people. It's the way my mind works, and that's you know, who I am and what I'm gonna share. So uh, if being overly critical is a problem for you as a viewer, whoever you are, any of you, all of you, doesn't matter, um, then uh, there are probably plenty of other terrain channels where they will just say what they liked about it and won't say anything else. So, um, you know, find the one that works for you, but, uh, but I'm gonna continue to point out those things where I think it could have been improved a little bit, so be prepared for that. And so um, those comments are from a back a bit and I am uh, trying to come up with a system to look through comments. I'm not gonna talk about it. I've talked about it before. I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, but maybe doing a couple comments at the end of videos like this will help me to stay on top of them better. So we'll see. Um, this is a, a series of videos. Um, I am gonna be shooting videos um, pretty much every day for this week, I'm trying to get you know, all the different uh, aspects of the board recorded for you. So um, this time when I say, I hope you come back and join me, it's because I really am going to be back soon with another Terrence Capes video.